Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Rice Cast. My name is Anthony Russo, uh, and I got here today to record the podcast after de icing my car. I had to you, had to start it, a, it a little was early it in a freezer or what? It's been frigid outside, <laughs> Pastor. This is what are we at? Seventy one, seventy two outside right now. We had two couple of nice days, and uh, but I think it's supposed to warm up again. Is but, it? Yes. Yeah. Doggone it! But yeah, but it's you can feel a fall. It, it's you can feel a fall. Just was a a little a little reminder yeah, to Floridians. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Falls the, out there. The intensity of the summer is over. It's I yeah, do think that. Good so, way to say it. Yeah, good way that. to say it. Beautiful time here, and uh, it, it, but then you say that, and you're like, when's it not beautiful here in Clearwater, <laughs> Florida? It's always great. Uh, but we are here. My name is Anthony Russo. I'm here with Doctor Pastor Willie Rice. Pastor, aside from the beautiful weather, how you feeling? How are uh, things? Great. Uh, busy week and a lot of. As always, seems like a lot happening at Calvary, and of course, a lot happening around the globe that uh, people are concerned about. But uh, doing well, thanks. I have a very—I want, I want to say it's a very personal question, okay. but it's a question for you. I was thinking of so um, some people will have experienced this and seen it happen. But our, we had a women's night of worship in the Word speaker who was not able to be there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Cheryl, your wife, had yep. to yep. had to go in. Did you give any tips? Is there? Did you have to? Was this like Mickey and Rocky a little bit of of the hey this is you got to put a message together stat here's what I do here's my here's my room I go into to knock all this out did you was there any of that going on in the rice house over last weekend um the uh, no uh, <laughs> the, short the, answer no uh, first of all she's a great teacher and quite capable. The, about the only advice I gave, and she's a great teacher. She teaches every, every Sunday, every Wednesday, in a yeah, small. And she love. prefers a more a smaller setting, you mm-hmm. know. Um, it it, it um, that's that's her wheelhouse. So it, not necessarily speaking to the large crowd is is she's more. Uh, she loves teaching the Bible, so yeah. she loves you know asking the question, sending it to a group, all that sort of thing. Um, uh, but uh, it, the, you know, last minute, of course, the the, the people putting on the women's conference had this uh, curveball thrown at them. Yeah, and there were a lot behind the scenes on that. And so, you know, they were looking at options, and and finally said, you know, just just teach. Now she works so hard on every message. If you know Cheryl, she studies intently, and she works very very hard. Mm. And uh, the only counsel I was was look. Just teach from the overflow. People understand this is a last, literally you had one day to prepare. Mm. And uh, I said, the Holy Spirit, you know, but she knows all this. So she didn't need me to tell her. But my, I hope it was an encouragement, was to say, um, just the Holy Spirit's going to take it, give you the words to say. Mm. And uh, I believe we ought to prepare as well as we can uh, every time we can. But I also believe there are moments when you just have to be willing to go with what you have yeah. and trust the Holy Spirit um, uh, we'll we'll take care of it. Give you the words to say. Yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes I preach the message. People say, "How long did it take you to prepare that?" And I go, well, "About forty years." <laughs> right. And yeah. what I mean by that is, you know, you no, know, I've been studying the Bible more than forty. I've been pastoring for forty years, and mm. you've been reading, you've been studying, and so yeah, it took me you know a week to prepare, but no, it took me forty years to kind of build some understanding and perspective. So yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes you just have to be able to say, okay, I, I, I know what I know. I'm going to trust the Lord. The Holy Spirit will give me the words. To say. And she kind of, she did that, and she knew that already. But she did a great job, and uh, the women had a great night, and I think everybody felt like the Lord showed up, and, and I hope, hopefully blessed a lot of people. Yeah, she really did a great job, and the comments were full of, like, Cheryl, you were God's plan A. <laughs> uh, was one of the good comments we got, Sweet. and so there was a there was a yeah. great response. Yeah. Um, I was watching online. Some people yeah. are hearing now, going like, "Why were you at the women's night worship in the word?" That was Anthony. you dressed up a little funny. Uh, yeah. It was not. I watch <laughs> online to make sure the stream's going off without a hitch, and so it was. And I listened in for a while, and she was doing just a fan. Yeah. I thought, man, she's just really good. crushing this with, and I knew kind of what had gone into that. So it was a special night. If you missed the Women's Night of Worship in the Word, we did hear from some women who were, oh, I'm really busy, I can't make it that night. You can go back and watch it. It's on our YouTube channel, so if you want to go back. And uh, the worship was fantastic. We, we, I feel like we always have a really, really strong group of female worship leaders. Like I, There yep. just always seems to be a couple around Calvary oh, at any yep. given moment. And so when they all come together, it's pretty it's it's special. Pretty special. Night. They did a great job and appreciate all the hard work. A lot of work goes into each one of those events. Mm-hmm. Production team, behind the scenes, oh, yeah. the worship team, 
Um, so I know our people appreciate it, but, uh, you know, if you are blessed by that, I hope, uh, you show that appreciation sometimes just to the people that, that aren't even on the platform that, mm-hmm. that make that night happen. Oh, sure. Lots, lots goes into it. Hey, I want to tell you before we get into this too, uh, listener, if you haven't already, we have a, uh, we have so much going on in October. It's like every couple of days I look ahead and we got some, some big thing coming up. But, uh, in the next couple of days we have a, uh, a membership intensive. If you have not yet joined the, uh, the Calvary family as a member, we offer these membership intensives a couple of times throughout the year. Uh, and that's coming up on Saturday. Yep, yep. And uh, I'll be there. I look forward to being a part of that, teaching a good part of that Saturday. So uh, for those who are ready to take that step, love to see you Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. You know, we've been talking a lot about this series in Second Timothy about staying faithful, uh, uh, keep the faith, obviously, is the title of the series. And, I, and so much of that, we've covered this a lot, but so much of that comes from being connected in not just connected loosely with sort of the big c global church but to have a church family that you're connected to i think has been a theme something we've come across a couple of times absolutely it's part of your spiritual growth it's part of your own journey spiritually so Mm -hmm. it's uh, people say why should i take that step i think because it helps you grow Mm -hmm. to be connected uh, to specific people in a specific context pursuing a specific mission together yeah. So that's coming up this coming Saturday. I'll put the link in the show notes if you would like to uh, if you'd like to sign up for that. We'd love to have you there. It's going to be a fun morning. But Pastor, I wanted to talk to you some today about um, this has uh, been all over the news. I think it's been on the top of everybody's mm-hmm. mind recently. It happened. Um, it kind of was breaking. Was it Saturday? Mm-hmm. Saturday evening mm-hmm. yeah. it was when I was first seeing it. We ended up addressing it some Sunday morning. Right. But it's about what's going on in Israel right now, the right. what started as, I, I, maybe you might be more versed on the timeline of it, but it, there was a, an attack that sort of mm. launched us into this. Is that right? Is that- exactly. Hamas, uh, and that, again, I'd have to go back on the exact timeline. Uh, seems like it was all breaking uh, Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, it would have been uh, there, you know, they're ahead of us uh, in time, of course. Uh, I think, what, eight hours. So it would have been during the day on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so it started hitting us very, very early. People were seeing it that morning, I think, as I got up. So, uh, yes, attack from uh, Hamas, which is a, a governing group. Again, a lot, of, a lot of confusion here. I don't profess to have all the answers, but a governing mm-hmm. group of the Palestinian people. And, um, and even that is very confusing to, for Americans to understand because it's like a country within a country. Right. And, uh, and Hamas uh, attacked Israel. Um, it, more people died than were killed in 9-11. It was a massive mm. um, event uh, targeting uh, civilians. Uh, and, of course, Israel has begun to respond, and that response is, is going to continue for weeks and months. Mm-hmm. This is the beginning of a, of a uh, chapter of conflict, and it's going to be very, very severe for a protracted amount of time. Mm-hmm. And the ramifications are huge because there is so much attention uh, given to the nation of Israel, mm-hmm. I think for many, many reasons. And, um, uh, and many Christians are interested in that for many, many reasons. Mm-hmm. So uh, we are all watching and praying and um, appropriately sober as we think about this event. Mm-hmm. By that, I mean self-controlled, uh, serious, thoughtful. Um, I'm Taking for granted that we're not inebriated. I'm, I'm taking right. you know, by right, sober. Right, right. I mean we're sober minded. Yes, yes, yes. And um, I think most of our podcast listeners are are uh, mm-hmm. not inebriated when they listen to the podcast. I hope not. Uh, but we're. I so, thought you were going to say most of our podcasts we've done sober, <laughs> and I was like, I I thought we were batting a thousand. Yeah, I think we're batting a thousand. <laughs> um, but uh, sober minded. Yes. You know this is serious, yeah. and uh, we're taking it seriously, and we're we're wrestling with it. In prayer, and so we're actually going to take time. I know this is very late breaking, and it it was you know it's just a last minute thing, and last minute things are last minute things. Yeah, yeah. I remember several years ago, I had a last minute idea, and I had some guys that say, "Well, why, I wish you'd have given us more notice." I said, "Well, if I'd have had the idea before then, I would have told you." Right, but right. 
I had it when I had it, so here we are. Yeah. Last minute deal is uh, uh, we're going to take some time at our uh, Clearwater campus uh, in our worship center tonight to talk some about how we think biblically and Christianly about this conflict in Israel, mm-hmm. a lot of questions that surround it, and then also a prayer time uh, tonight. Uh, some of those campuses may even be streaming it. Literally, this is happening in real time. Mm-hmm. So I can't sit here and tell you, but I think we are streaming it. Mm-hmm. from the Clearwater campus I yeah. learned uh, moments ago. So if you're listening to this on, you know, I don't know when you're listening to this, but if it's Wednesday, um, then uh, if you want to come tonight, you're welcome to come tonight. And if it's after, we will, uh, it's on our Facebook okay. or our YouTube, you'll be able to watch it. Uh, whenever you listen to the podcast, you can go back and, ch- and, and check it. So I want to talk some about this, but we'll obviously go more into it a little bit later today. Um, yeah, particularly egregious, you know, really um, – I know some of the images and videos that came out of this. This isn't it, – it, it was very um, – it, not for the faint of heart. It was a really, oh. like, ugly kind it's of awful. scene yeah. with this initial attack. I think there's a lot of reasons, like you said, why it, it elicited such a response in so many people, but not the least of which was the civilians involved, the um, humiliation that was going on. Or, well, or, I, mean, it, I mean, again, I mean, children were beheaded. Women have been raped. People are being held hostage. Elderly people have been – shot and killed this was an attack on civilians this is not you know you have to sometimes when you look at military conquest um you uh, there are degrees of evil Mm -hmm. you know pearl harbor was an evil and unprovoked attack but it was an attack on a military base so Mm -hmm. no way am i excusing it minimizing the attack that sent the united states in world war ii yeah but it was an attack on a military base and military personnel doesn't make it right then i'm not saying that saying there are degrees of evil right um, uh, and, uh, this was an attack though, directed like nine eleven more at civilians. Mm-hmm. It was a non-military target. These right. are not, not military people. Many hundreds of them, I understand were at some type of music festival. Mm. So, I mean, you know, yeah. this is just people living their life and it was, it is designed, it is designed to, pro- a, 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 an action like that. You have to ask yourself, what is the strategic value of a, an attack like that? Mm-hmm. For instance, and again, I'm not saying that we're some kind of great military strategy. Sure. Maybe you are, but, you know. Um, you know, if you look at the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, mm-hmm. what is the strategic value? Well, it was to hamper the United States' effort in Pacific uh, Ocean, uh, the Pacific theater, for the entire war. It's to cripple the military might of the United States. People debate about whether or not Japan ever had any intentions of invading the United States. But what you're trying to do is they were trying to cut the strength of the United States before they ever got started. Probably the closest base. Yes, by crippling the military might of the United States. Sure. And it worked to a point. Obviously, it it, 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 it was a bad strategy in the end, but it worked to a point because Mm -hmm. it did cripple us out of the gate. Um, it, it, what is the strategic value of this? Uh, there, there could have been no, no one thinking that um, uh, the, the Palestinian leaders, Hamas, that they were going to somehow defeat Israel or invade mm-hmm. Israel at this point. It was de- so these terrorist attacks are called that because they are designed to provoke terror, mm-hmm. to provoke fear. Mm-hmm. And then you can ask, well, what is the purpose in that? What is what is your next? Um, Line of thinking, and that actually is very interesting in this case because almost no one believes that Hamas would think that they could somehow defeat Israel militarily. They would mm-hmm. have to be very, very unwise to think that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're—I know we're getting in the weeds here on that, but I think one of the reasons that they did this is because they are provoking Israel to respond, mm-hmm. which Israel almost has to. Mm-hmm. They will. They know they will. And I think this is speculation on my part, pure speculation. I think part of that is to provoke Israel to a response and then to be able to turn world opinion against Israel Mm -hmm. or to create this pressure against Israel and in many ways to block what were some advances in peace between, say, the Israelis and the uh, and Saudis. There were some peace treaties that had begun under uh, President Trump hmm. and uh, were even being continued in the Biden administration. Um, it, it's going to be very difficult to see those followed through on. And Islamic extremists do not want anyone making peace with Israel. Hmm. 
Uh, the reason they hate us is because we're at peace with Israel. Mm-hmm. We're a supporter of Israel, and they do not want anyone in the Arab world making peace with Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that is they have per, they have done something so egregious, so outrageous, so shocking. Israel must respond, yeah. and will respond, and I think they predicted that, and I think they are hoping to create a uh, global response that then would condemn Israel for the response, mm. I think. And and you say, yes, but thousands of people will suffer and die, including more Palestinians than Israel- Israelis when this is over. Mm-hmm. They don't care. The answer is they don't care. You have to understand that the value of human life to such extremists is at such a low level, Mm -hmm. they just simply don't care Mm -hmm. about human life. And so that is collateral damage to them, even if it's their own people. Mm -hmm. Hamas is famous for putting headquarters in places like hospitals and schools and daring you to attack. Mm -hmm. And, um, And Israel will attack. It almost has to in this case, and uh, that will create more civilian casualties, mm. and that will – they. I think their strategy is to inflame the Arab world against Israel. Mm. A lot of that's speculation, of sure. course, but that but, makes more sense to me than anything. But you touched a lot on, I think, what was everybody's first response to this, which was you're just I, – I don't know. You just – I hope that in the global news cycle we live in today – we can, as people, though, not grow hard to see yeah, he- yeah. innocent people suffer. I, I hope that if you're listening, you're like, man, I had this oh. big response to that. But that's so natural. Yeah, because- we are hardened because, you know, this 24-hour news cycle is like, okay, that was a news Saturday. What's happening today? Right. Oh, yeah. What's happening today? Right. This is a historic event. Mm-hmm. Um, th- this, uh, as the Israelis have said, this is our 9-11. Mm-hmm. And um, 9-11 shifted American foreign policy in some significant ways and changed the way we live even today. Mm-hmm. If, you've been, if, you go, if you go to the airport and fly, yep. we do things today that we do commonly that we did not do before 9-11. That's right. Um, if you travel, there are things we do today that were not done before 9-11. We changed radically. Mm-hmm. And even since then, I think we've gotten a little bit lax and comfortable. Um, but this is going to change Middle East policy, maybe for a generation. Mm-hmm. I, I, I almost, I don't want to overstate it something, but I almost think this event of the past weekend is going to define Middle East politics. It could, you know, for the rest of our lives. Mm. This is going to be a defining moment. Yeah. And um, it, it is... Um, for all who have prayed for peace and long for peace in the Middle East, it it, it should grieve us all. Mm. What I wonder if you might talk some, and I know we're going to talk more about this tonight. And again, if you are not, wherever you're listening to this podcast, is is a Wednesday as we're recording uh, Wednesday night. We are going to talk more extensively and we're kind of streaming a forum and prayer time on some of these issues. But I wonder if you might, for a listener who doesn't know why it is of particular interest to Christians. I mean, we all know that yep. you said this Sunday, while this is awful, while I hope it breaks our heart every time we see something like this, this does happen in all parts of the world, not to this degree, right. but there are atrocities that happen all over the world all the time. Yeah, we would be shocked if this were two African countries or two Asian countries or two South American countries or two European countries. This is an unmitigated, unprovoked mm-hmm. attack. Um, you know, we still think of, you know, Russia and Ukraine in a global mm-hmm. conflict and uh, a lot of the reasons for that. But but this was a an attack on civilians mm-hmm. without any real military value. Right. Again, this was not an attack on a base in order to take a city. Right. There's no, no, none of that. This is an attack upon civilians in order to strike terror, mm. in order to express hatred. And then you have to ask, surely they must have thought through what's going to happen next. Right. And if they did, then they must have anticipated Israel's response. And then if they did, they must think, and this is how the Arab world will respond to that. Right. To me, that makes the most sense. But yeah. again, what do I know? Right. Why is it of such interest? Because Israel is of such interest. Mm. And I think there is a, um, you know, you could think about this on so many levels. There are just political levels. And then there are uh, political slash spiritual religious issues. Mm. And it is, it, 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 they, they are intertwined, you know. There's a reason why Israel has such political importance to Americans, 
but you cannot really fully explain that without, I think, understanding something about the spiritual uh, part of that. Now, there are going to be all kinds of theories that are bandied about. There are all kinds of prophetic theories mm-hmm. in regards to mm-hmm. Israel in the end times, and you can quickly get in the weeds on that, and it's a fascinating study, really. Um, I'm, I, I, we certainly don't have the time to get into all of that. But why is Israel important? Well, it's important because of the past. Um, you know, as Christians, we under you can't understand our faith without understanding Israel. It's the Old Testament. The Old mm-hmm. Covenant is the story of God and Israel. And Jesus comes through Israel to save the world. So when you understand the grand story of Scripture, sometimes called the meta narrative, the big story of Scripture, Israel is a part of that. It is the the foundation, if you will, the root, if you will, from which uh, the Messiah comes and and thus from which the church is born. So uh, those of us who are Christians, um, uh, as well as our Jewish friends, uh, and honestly, even Muslims, all are going back to that, that, uh, that ancient Israel and God working through That's Abraham right. and his descendants. So, first of all, just for the historic significance of mm-hmm. it, we care about Israel. The present significance of Israel as a strategic nation in the world. Mm. Um, one of the maps, and there are a lot of maps I've seen today, and again, it depends what side of this conflict you take, but there are some people who show the map of how much territory Israel has in comparison to the Palestinian people within the nation of Israel. Okay. And that alone confuses Americans, because again, it's like a nation within a nation, and I'll, maybe we can talk about that in a moment. Mm. But they will say, hey, the, the amount of territory that Palestinians have been able to control has been decreasing consistently over the last 50 years. Well, that's true. But what you need to do is pull your map out a lot further and look at the amount of land Israel controls compared to that which Arab-dominated nations control. Mm. And then you will see Israel as this tiny speck of democracy mm. surrounded by the Arab world, which is largely dominated by non-democratic governments mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Muslim-dominated countries and uh, some of the most oppressive countries in the world. Now, mm-hmm. some are relatively free, like Jordan, for instance. I was in Jordan in the summer. Relatively free, relatively safe, uh, relatively pro-Western. Mm. Um, fr- people are friendly in Jordan. Uh, they, they don't really like Israel, but I think they're living at peace with Israel. They share mm-hmm. a border. Uh, we were on the verge of uh, some historic accords between Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel. Mm. And by the way, the Trump administration, again, I, I'm not getting in politics here, okay? Mm-hmm. But the Trump administration does not get enough credit for how much uh, they work to bring about peace in the Middle East. Mm. There were some very significant breakthroughs under President Trump. And, um, I mean, we were on the verge of a moment of peace. Now, the Biden administration tried to carry those accords through, but I'm getting a little political here. I'll go ahead and share my humble and accurate opinion. But uh, the the course reversal in the Biden administration uh, in regards to Iran, mm. I think, has been disastrous. Mm. And um, And I think... I do believe that it has something to do with what happened over the last weekend. Mm. Absolutely, I do. And I think it's absolutely disastrous. Um, the the Biden administration and before that, the Obama administration, in my opinion, this is my humble opinion, badly, badly, badly underestimated the, the evil that exists in um, uh, many of the Muslim-dominated countries. That is not to say that every Muslim is a warmonger. Uh, I'm not saying that, but I am saying that um, in countries like Iran, to believe that they are a good actor mm. is terribly naive, and they are very dangerous. And uh, these are countries that want to eliminate Israel. These are countries that want to kill Israel, and they hate us because we support Israel. Mm. So ge- so it's, it's significant because of its geopolitical ramifications today. Sure. It is an island of democracy in a sea of totalitarianism mm. and Islamic totalitarianism at that. Uh, the future interests uh, have to do with prophetic questions. And mm. that is a whole host of questions, which very fascinating discussion. There's a time and place for that. I, it would dominate the entire conversation if, we, if the conversation became about that. But many believe that 
uh, depending on how you understand biblical prophecy, that the physical nation of Israel today, even though it is largely a secular state, Mm -hmm. people need to understand most Jews are not religious today. Mm. Most Jews living in Israel are not religious. Mm -hmm. There is maybe about 10% that is an orthodox religious group, and they're growing, by the way, but they're an overwhelming minority. Most Jews living in Israel are secular. Mm-hmm. They would even identify as agnostic or something like right. that. Right. There's a difference between a, a Jewish person and a person practicing and saying Judaism. Judaism. Yep, right, yep. Right. And then there are branches of Judaism mm-hmm. r- r- ranging from the the what you think of as orthodox. Mm-hmm. These are the people that dress and uh, uh, the way they pray at the Wailing Wall and they, they wear the certain dress and so mm-hmm. forth. Uh, to kind of the middle range, you have groups like Reform Judaism and other things uh, that are more moderate. These, these are your Jewish friends who are just normally acclimated to culture, and you really don't notice any difference. They may observe certain Jewish holidays, mm-hmm. much like some Americans who are very irreligious still observe Christmas. Sure. It's a holiday, it's a culture, and they, they may have some level of religious faith, but it's very little mm-hmm. by their own admission. This mm-hmm. is not, I'm not trying to be pejorative here, yeah. I'm just stating facts. And then, of course, many of our Jewish friends have very little, would just tell you they're agnostic. Uh, and that would be very common in in the nation of Israel. So we're not talking about a believing group of Jewish people. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, but nevertheless, uh, depending on how you understand biblical prophecy, there does seem to be uh, events that the Bible foretells that are happening in and around a physical nation of Israel. Mm. And uh, and thus, when we see things like this happening, mm-hmm. it, it brings to mind many of the theories that we have heard. We can easily imagine a scenario right now where multiple nations will be, before this is over, arrayed against Israel. Mm. Israel is going to respond decisively and dramatically. That is going to inflame the Arab world, I am afraid. Uh, and then the question is exactly what are they going to try to do? Mm-hmm. And then what we are seeing in the West is that many democracies and Western democracies that have historically been pro-Israel and pro-democracy because of immigration issues, because of the erosion of Christian values, um, that support to Israel is not isn't necessarily automatic anymore. Mm. You're seeing pro-Palestinian rallies take place in huge cities in the West. You've seen them online, if you've mm. been online at all. So the question is, what will the world community do mm. if um, if this turns into a conflict? Again, I'm not trying to be a fear monger. Yeah, yeah. But one, the, the reason people are concerned is this. Mm-hmm. It does not seem like a far-fetched fairy tale, it's not a fairy tale, nightmare, Mm -hmm. that this could conflate into a global conflict. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it does not. Mm -hmm. We pray it does not. Right. But it could be something like this that causes it to occur. And then the question gets raised in many Christians' mind is, is this the end? Yeah. Is this the beginning? You know, is this uh, a moment in which uh, the globe will be... Uh, immersed, immersed rather in a conflict against the nation of Israel. That's mm-hmm. the question being asked. Mm. And does that have anything to do with the return of Christ? Mm. That's a fair question. I don't know that there's an easy, clear answer. Some people think there is, but I think we approach those things humbly, carefully. Mm-hmm. Um, could be, you know, you know. Sometimes it's could be. You know, we're we're not told to be able to predict exactly a day or an hour. Yeah. But we watch these events carefully. I think you would have to be very, very clueless to be watching these events and not think about end-time matters and to think about the potential of a global conflict and enemies being arrayed against Israel and then thinking about some of these biblical prophecies. So Mm. we think about it, and uh, we're watching it. So I think that's why it's very, very important. Well, what do you think is like an appropriate uh, response then uh, as a believer, as someone who's watching all this and you may be your, – your, your brain is kind of running after some of those things you mentioned, but your heart is breaking over the mm-hmm, images mm-hmm, you're seeing and mm-hmm. the stories you're hearing. Yep, yep. Uh, what, is, what is an appropriate response? Well, I think there are a number of – and not necessarily in the right order. I think – but first and foremost, when you watch events like this, it should – I don't want to use the word scare you, but it should be a sobering, uh, awakening moment to think. Jesus is coming again. Mm. 
He is coming again. This is not a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. As I said Sunday, the guy with the placard walking around in the fair saying the end is near, we've always thought that guy's crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, he's just, you know, yeah, yeah. He's just a guy, crazy guy. And you know what? He may be. I've met plenty of them that are crazy. Um, you know, but let me tell you what is a far more dangerous idea. It isn't the goof. It isn't a nutcase who yeah. somehow gets enamored with some prophetic theory and he thinks he knows when the end is. And right. He's saying the end is near. The end is near. Uh, far greater danger is to believe the end is never coming, because hmm. that's the danger. That's the lie that most people believe. Mm-hmm. They live as if there will be no end. I think when events like this happen, we ought to ask, "Am I ready for the end? Hmm. Am I ready to meet Jesus? Am I ready?" We ought to ask that question. And we don't ask it enough, but we should ask. Am I ready? Can I pray? Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Hmm. doesn't mean I don't love my life and I want to see the next 20 years. Sure, it means sure. that I trust God in his great plan to do what is right, and he is going to reign on earth as is in heaven. And I believe this. And I think in the modern church we have lost an, an eschatological emphasis that talks about the second coming and the return of Christ. And, um, and so first... Am I ready? Hmm. Everyone listening to this podcast should ask myself, am I ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Hmm. Am I ready for the to stand before the Lord? Am I do I eagerly await that? Yeah. In the sense that even so, Lord Jesus come. Hmm. That's the first question. Number two, uh, we should pray. Hmm. We should pray. And we'll talk about how to pray tonight. We could go into that because Jesus has told us how to pray. Mm-hmm. So we can pray. You don't have to have all the answers. I was saying to somebody, look, at lunch, you know, how do I pray when an Israeli fighter is zooming over a Palestinian city and dropping bombs? You know, what do I pray? Like, right, right. only hit certain people. You know, well, I do pray that. But, you know, how do you pray for that? Right? We all don't. Like, how do I pray? Yeah. Like, get them. But what about the people that are innocent? What about right. the people? And by the way, and I again, let me just stop and say, there are plenty of Palestinian people that are wonderful people. Mm-hmm. I've been there. I've, I know Palestinian people. I know people that are partially Jew. I know people that are completely Jew. And I know people who are Palestinian. I know Christian Palestinians. There is a Christian Palestinian community. And... Beautiful people, wonderful people. Mm-hmm. They're not so. Some, don't get some caricature that every Palestinian is a Muslim extremist. Mm-hmm. That's just not true. Yeah, yeah. And some of them are caught up in situations that they would grieve over. Yeah, that they are not represented by these terrorists. Yeah, and uh, there are Palestinians who are, you know, their lives are going to be made immeasurably harder mm-hmm. and worse because of this. Yeah. So we grieve over that. Yeah. And. Um, and by the way, the Israelis know this, um, and um, they, they, you know, the Israeli government, like ours, tries to be strategic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, I don't know of any event where the Israeli government would sanction the killing of civilians. Right. Something may happen on accident. Right. And something is going to happen in this conflict because they are going to come after Hamas. Mm-hmm. So you are going to see Hamas, and you're, this is what you're going to see on the news then. Mm-hmm. Hospitals blown up, schools blown up, and so on and so forth. Um, but how do you pray? That was our question. Yeah, how do you yeah. pray in this? You know, I pray for the will of God to be done. Mm-hmm. That's what I pray. I pray for evil to be defeated. Mm. I can pray that. Um, I pray for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Mm. I can pray with compassion for people who are suffering. Yeah. Um, I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. Right, right. Can I tell Israel not to fight against what they see as injustice? Would you have said that to an American the day after Pearl Harbor? Mm. What, should we have in World War II stood down and let concentration camps exist and mm. people butchered? Very few people would say that because we see in our mind that's a clear distinction of moral versus immoral, of right yeah. versus wrong. Well, let me just tell you again, you're seeing people who uh, who hand glided into a musical festival and butchered innocent civilians. Mm. You're seeing crowds around the world chant, gas the Jews. I saw one crowd in Sydney, Australia, gas the Jews, they were saying. Mm. A crowd in New York City was demonstrating, holding up Nazi swastikas. Mm. Um, so do we just say, well, you know, we don't, we won't fight evil? Um, so I think Israel is going to fight evil. Mm. They're going to come out. So I'm, I don't blame Israel for that. But I can grieve that it has to be done. Oh, I yeah. can grieve over the harm. I can weep for those who are 
hurt. Mm -hmm. And I can pray for peace. That doesn't mean I'm telling Israel to disarm or cease fire. You know, it's like, you know, it's like the two boys that got in a fight, I heard, they brought to the principal's office. And the one boy said, look, this all started when Johnny hit me back. And, <laughs> you know, so it's like you, you have these conflicts, somebody does something, and then there's, and then right after it, let's have a ceasefire. Yeah, yeah. When, you know, maybe you should have thought about a ceasefire before you right. slaughtered a thousand people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I expect Israel to strike back. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is, uh, in Hamas and in this Islamic extremism, is a truly evil ideology. Mm. And... Um, I, I I can pray that evil should be opposed, mm. but I can grieve at the same time over the loss of life, and mm-hmm. I can grieve for Palestinian people who are going to suffer, Absolutely. even as I grieve for grieve over the Jewish people who are weeping today and yeah. burying their loved ones and others who are being held hostage. And given the conflict, there's you know high probability that they're going to be killed. Right. You know, if you don't grieve and weep and and by the way, we you need to create space to lament. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. part of what the biblical tradition teaches us. Yeah, it's not a waste of time; it's uh, necessary. Mm-hmm. And part of what we do tonight when we gather for prayer is just to create space. To, yeah, to lament. Yeah, and um, to to feel the heaviness of it, <coughs> and to pray for God's help and God's blessing on those people, mm-hmm. and to pray that in the midst of this mess. The kingdom of God would come on earth as it is in heaven, because that is the only hope this broken world has. Amen. And uh, yeah, definitely a lot of a lot of great stuff you said. I, I know for so many of us, yeah, it's very well said. Your heart goes out to all the people that are just caught in the middle of this. Mm-hmm. That are just you know, mm-hmm. we we talked about this some. I think in Russia and Ukraine, it's there's there's Russian families. They have nothing oh. to do with this. Yeah. But they will be – their economy will be destroyed. Their life will be forever ruined by decisions that are 100 percent outside of their hands. So you definitely – definitely your thoughts drift there, your prayers to those that will be – Where I always – in times like these too, I'm always just like so aware. I'm, I'm 30, whatever I am. Uh and, and we just have never known this, right? Like we've never known the reality yeah, of war yeah. on our – and as an American. Right. Um, it's kind of this other thing that lives out there. And we've heard stories. Certainly there's, there's mm-hmm. still veterans alive who have seen war. There's people that have served our country bravely. And all that is still real. I'm not trivializing that. But for our day-to-day life, I don't – I certainly think we can and we should let ourselves – Yep, yep. Here. It's always been something happening somewhere else. We yeah. sent soldiers somewhere else, and to that some degree still is. But I tell you what changes is the news cycle, the information, um, which was true at 9-11 already, but it's even that much more true 20-some years later, that the visual images now yeah. are such that it's not just over there. It's on the screen I hold in my hand. Right. It's it's on the, the – now the social media, it doesn't even have to go through mainstream media. Right. It now is there on Twitter and Instagram and all the social media sites being reported 24-7. Mm. I can pick up my phone probably right now and watch bombs being dropped. Mm. You can see the images mm-hmm. that are too horrible really to see. Um, so it's almost like this is something new for us. Yeah. It's not just over there and a three-minute clip of some fighting. Now those who want to see it sadly see it, mm-hmm. and um, it is tragic. It is a reminder of all that we have to be grateful for as Americans. It is a reminder that evil is is real in the world, mm-hmm. and um, you have to be prepared to fight it. Um, again, I know Christians have different concepts as they struggle through that, but historically, uh, church theologians have, have understood that there is a moment in which, um, governments can contend for that, which is righteous and Mm. just and must the same reason the city of Clearwater has police, Mm. you know, we can all sit here and say, well, we do, you know, look, we need police. Why? Because bad things, bad people are going to do bad things, Mm. right? So we need police. Because bad people are going to do bad things. We need armies. Why? Because bad people are going to do bad things. Mm-hmm. And if if you live in a world where you are naive and don't believe that evil is real, then you are naive, but you are more than naive. You're just being foolish. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, there are a lot of Americans who are being influenced by a number of things. And I don't. What concerns me greatly 
is, and, and again, why I wanted this as a church to be able to process some of this information is I'm not even sure that many Americans can recognize the difference between good and evil at this point. Mm. And, um, and that should be very, very alarming to us. Mm-hmm. You know, in World War II, everyone could understand what was right and wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't mean everything we did was right and everything, you know, but I, I get it. I get it. But there was a clear moral distinction here. I, 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 I wonder today mm-hmm. if we're capable of making that moral distinction. Mm. I hope we're not that far gone. Mm. But I'm telling you, there are a lot of people that are. And uh, this is what happens when you move away from God, to be honest. In a culture and in a society, when you distance yourself from God, you distance yourself from truth and you distance yourself from moral sanity. Mm. And then when a situation comes, you don't have the principles. You don't have the foundation. You don't have the, the, the frame in which to interpret reality and understand the difference between someone who is butchering the heads off of children and someone trying to defend their home. Mm. Like you don't know the difference between the two. Mm. Um, so this is the great cost in a culture that simply dismisses the Bible, repudiates God, and no longer believes the worship of God is important. You will wake up one day and you don't know up from down. Hmm. So hopefully we're not there yet, but I, I can say this as a church, we need to know. And that's why we talk about this, why we took some time today to talk about it. And um, and I, 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 I just want to say this on the podcast. I'll say it tonight. There is no moral equivalency here. You're going to hear arguments that that say, hey, the Palestinian people were oppressed and they were just acting out of that. And is, Listen, there's no moral equivalency here. I, we could talk a long time about the condition of the Palestinians in Israel. Maybe we'll try a little bit tonight to help people understand some of those dynamics. But there is no moral equivalency between someone who comes and butchers civilians mm-hmm. and someone trying to defend their home. Mm. Those are not the same thing. One is evil and one is necessary in a fallen world. Mm. So people making a moral equivalency here are very foolish. Mm-hmm. And, and sadly, some people aren't even there. They're beyond that. They're calling what is evil good and what is good evil. Mm. So um, you ask me, if you ask me, do you, do you care about this fight? I do. I support Israel. Mm-hmm. I absolutely support Israel. Does that mean I agree with everything Israel has ever done or everything Israel has done in this treatment of Palestinians and that I don't empathize with Palestinian people who uh, have suffered a great deal? No, no, none of that's true. I, all those, this is multi-layered. Mm-hmm. But a nation that defends itself against a brutal attack against civilians is not the same thing as the people brutally attacking civilians. Those are two different things. Mm. The person who pushes a little old lady into oncoming traffic is not the same as a person who tries to help a little old lady across the street. Mm-hmm. Those are two different things. One is evil and one is not, and you better know the difference. Mm. Man, so much in there, and we're going to talk more tonight. Thank you for sharing a lot of that uh, here on the podcast. It gives us a chance to talk, uh, have a little bit more dialogue on some of these. But tonight, uh, as of this recording, again, we record on Wednesday, Wednesday night. Uh, it's going to be here live at the Clearwater campus, but we're going to stream it online. Uh, you can check your campus Facebook group if you are at our East Lake Crystal Beach or Seminole campus. That's where you'll get information uh, on whether or not it'll be you know at the campus. But it, maybe you just meet with your group tonight. And you can uh, catch up, uh, watch it after that. Uh, it just will be something we're talking about tonight if you want to hear a little bit more about it. And we're going to take some time to pray, which I think is a good thing for all of us right now. But, um, yeah, again, Pastor, thanks for sharing, uh, going in and, and talking some more about that. Uh, we'll be back here with another podcast episode very soon.